The tenth lesson of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arabella Grayson. A series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka. The tenth lesson, part two. Each of us has a friend in our own mind. A score of them, in fact, who delight in performing services for us, if we will but allow them to do so. Not only have we a higher self to whom we may turn for comfort and aid in times of deep distress and necessity, but we have these invisible mental workers on the subconscious plane, who are very willing and glad to perform much of our mental work for us, if we will but give them the material in proper shape. It is very difficult to impart specific directions for obtaining these results, as each case must depend to a great extent upon the peculiar circumstances surrounding it. But we may say that the main thing needed is to lick into shape the material, and then pass it on to the subconscious mind in the manner spoken of a few moments ago. Let us run over a few cases wherein this principle may be applied. Let us suppose that you are confronted with a problem consisting of an uncertainty as to which of two or more courses to adopt in some affair of life. Each course seems to have some advantages and disadvantages, and you seem unable to pass upon the matter clearly and intelligently. The more you try, the more perplexed and worried do you become. Your mind seems to tire of the matter and manifest a state which may be called mental nausea. This state will be apparent to anyone who has had much thinking to do. The average person, however, persists in going over the matter, notwithstanding the tired condition of the mind, and its evident distaste for a further consideration of the subject. They will keep on forcing it back to the mind for consideration, and even at night time will keep thrashing away at the subject. Now this course is absurd. The mind recognizes that the work should be done by another part of itself, its digestive region in fact, and naturally rebels at the finishing up machinery being employed in work unsuited for it. According to the subconsciousing plan, the best thing for the man to do would be for him first to calm and quiet his mind. Then he should arrange the main features of the problem, together with the minor details, in their proper places. Then he should pass them slowly before him in review, giving a strong interest and attention to each fact and detail as it passes before him, but without the slightest attempt to form a decision or come to a conclusion. Then having given the matter an interested and attentive review, let him will that it pass on to his subconscious mind, forming the mental image of dropping it through the trap door, and at the same time giving the command of the will, attend to this for me. Then dismiss the matter from your conscious mind by an effort of command of the will. If you find it difficult to do this, you may soon acquire the mastery by a frequent assertion, I have dismissed this matter from my conscious mind and my subconscious mind will attend to it for me. Then, endeavor to create a mental feeling of perfect trust and confidence in the matter, and avoid all worry or anxiety about it. This may be somewhat difficult at the first trial, but will become a natural feeling after you have gained the confidence arising from successful results in several cases. The matter is one of practice, and like anything else that is new, must be acquired by perseverance and patience. It is well worth the time and trouble, and once acquired will be regarded as something in the nature of a treasure discovered in an unexpected place. The sense of tranquility and content, of calm and confidence, that comes to one who has practiced this plan, will of itself be worth all the trouble, not to speak of the main result. To one who has acquired this method, the old worries, fretting, and general stewed-up feeling will seem like a relic of barbarism. The new way opens up a world of new feelings and content. In some cases, the matter will be worked out by the subconscious mind in a very short time, and in fact we have known cases in which the answer would be flashed back almost instantly, almost like an inspiration. But in the majority of cases, more or less time is required. The subconscious mind works very rapidly, but it takes time to arrange the thought material properly and to shape it into the desired forms. In the majority of cases, it is well to let the matter rest until the next day, a fact that gives us a clue to the old advice to sleep over an important proposition before passing a final decision. If the matter does not present itself the following day, bring it up again before the conscious mind for review. You will find that it has shaped itself up considerably and is assuming definite form and clearness. But right here, and this is important, 
do not make the mistake of again dissecting it and meddling with it and trying to arrange it with your conscious mind but instead give it attention and interest in its new form and then pass it back again to the subconscious mind for further work you will find an improvement each time you examine it but right here another word of caution do not make the mistake of yielding to the impatience of the beginner and keep on repeatedly bringing up the matter to see what is being done give it time to have the work done on it do not be like the boy who planted seeds and who each day would pull them up to see whether they had sprouted and how much sooner or later the subconscious mind will of its own choice lift up the matter and present it to you in its finished shape for the consideration of the conscious mind the subconscious mind does not insist that you shall adopt its views or accept its work but merely hands out to you the results of its sorting classifying and arranging the choice and will still remains yours but you will often find that there is seen to be one plan or path that stands out clearly from the others and you will very likely adopt that one the secret is that the subconscious mind with its wonderful patience and care has analyzed the matter and has separated things before apparently connected it has also found resemblances and has combined things heretofore considered opposed to each other in short it has done for you all that you could have done with the expenditure of great work and time and done it well and then it lays the matter before you for your consideration and verdict its whole work seems to have been in the nature of assorting dissecting analyzing and arranging the evidence and then presenting it before you in a clear systematic shape it does not attempt to exercise the judicial prerogative or function but seems to recognize that its work ceases with the presentation of the edited evidence and that of the conscious mind begins at the same point now do not confuse this work with that of the intuition which is a very different mental phase or plane this subconscious working just mentioned plays an entirely different part it is a good servant and does not try to be more the intuition on the contrary is more like a higher friend a friend at court as it were who gives us warnings and advice in our directions we have told you how to make use of this part of the mind consciously and knowingly so as to obtain the best results and to get rid of worry and anxiety attended upon unsettled questions but in fact every one of us makes more or less use of this part of the mind unconsciously and not realizing the important part it plays in our mental life we are perplexed about a matter and keep it on our minds until we are forced to lay it aside by reason of some other demand or when we sink to sleep often to our surprise we will find that when we next think of it the matter has somehow cleared up and straightened itself out and we seem to have learned something about it that we did not know before we do not understand it and are apt to dismiss it as just one of those things in these lessons we are attempting to explain some of those things and to enable you to use them consciously and understandingly instead of by chance instinctively and clumsily we are teaching you mastery of the mind now to apply the rule to another case suppose you wish to gather together all the information that you possess relating to a certain subject in the first place it is certain that you know a very great deal more about any subject than you think you do stored away in the various recesses of the mind or memory if you prefer that term are stray bits of information and knowledge concerning almost any subject but these bits of information are not associated with each other you have never attempted to think attentively upon the particular question before you and the facts are not correlated in the mind it is just as if you had so many hundred pounds of anything scattered throughout the space of a large warehouse a tiny bit here and a tiny bit there mixed up with thousands of other things you may prove this by sitting down some time and letting your thoughts run along the lines of some particular subject and you will find emerging into the field of consciousness all sorts of information that you had apparently forgotten and each fitting itself into its proper place every person has had experiences of this kind but the work of gathering together the scattered scraps of knowledge is more or less tedious for the conscious mind and the subconscious mind will do the work equally well with the wear and tear on the attention in fact it is the subconscious mind that always does the work even when you think it is the conscious mind all the conscious mind does is to hold the attention firmly upon the object before it and then let the subconsciousness pass the material before it but this holding the attention is tiresome work 
and it is not necessary for it to expend its energies upon the details of the task, for the work may be done in an easier and simpler way. The best way is to follow a plan similar to the one mentioned a few pages back. That is, to fix the interested attention firmly upon the question before you until you manage to get a clear, vivid impression of just what you want answered. Then pass the whole matter into the subconscious mind with a command, Attend to this, and then leave it. Throw the whole matter off of your mind and let the subconscious work go on. If possible, let the matter run along until the next morning, and then take it up for consideration, when, if you have proceeded properly, you will find the matter worked out, arranged in logical sequence, so that your conscious attention will be able to clearly review the string of facts, examples, illustrations, experiences, etc., relating to the matter in question. Now many of you will say that you would like this plan to work in cases in which you have not the time to sleep over it. In such cases, we will say that it is possible to cultivate a rapid method of subconsciousing, and in fact many businessmen and men of affairs have stumbled upon a similar plan, driven to the discovery by necessity. They will give a quick, comprehensive, strong flash of attention upon the subject, getting right to the heart of it, and then will let it rest in the subconscious mind for a moment or two, killing a minute or two of time in preliminary conversation until the first flash of answer comes to them. After the first flash, and taking hold of the first loose end of the subject that presents itself to them, they will unwind a string of information and talk about the subject that will surprise even themselves. Many lawyers have acquired this knowledge and are what is known as resourceful. Such men are often confronted with questions of conditions utterly unsuspected by them a moment before. Practice has taught them the folly of fear and the loss of confidence at such moments, and has also impressed upon them the truth that something within them will come to the rescue. So presenting a confident air, they will manage to say a few platitudes or commonplaces while the subconscious mind is most rapidly gathering its materials for the answer. In a moment, an idea passes before his conscious and eager attention, sometimes so rapidly that it is almost impossible to utter them, and lo, the danger is over, and a brilliant success is often snatched from the jaws of an apparent failure and defeat. In such cases, the mental demand upon the subconscious mind is not voiced in words, but is a result of a strong mental need. However, if one gives a quick verbal command, attend to this, the result will be heightened. We have known of cases of men prominent in the world's affairs who made a practice of smoking a cigar during important business interviews, not because they particularly cared for tobacco, but because they had learned to appreciate the value of a moment's time for the mind to gather itself together, as one man expressed it. A question would be asked or a proposition advanced suddenly, demanding an immediate answer. Under the watchful eyes of the other party, the question party tried not to show, by his expression, any indication of searching for an answer, for obvious reasons. So, instead, he would take a long puff at the cigar, then a slow, attentive look at the ashes on its tip, and then another moment consumed in flicking the ash into the receptacle, and then came the answer, slowly. Well, as to that, or some other words of that kind, prefacing the real answer, which he had been rapidly framed by the subconscious mind, in time to be uttered in its proper place. The few moments of time gained had been sufficient for the subconscious mind to gather up its materials, and the matter to be shaped properly, without any appearance of hesitation on the part of the answerer. All of this required practice, of course, but the principle may be seen through it all, and in every similar case. The point is that the man in such cases set some hidden part of his mind to work for him, and when he begins to speak the matter is at least roughly licked into shape for him. Our students will understand, of course, that this is not advice to smoke cigars during interviews of importance, but is merely given to illustrate the principle. We have known other men to twirl a lead pencil in their fingers in a lazy sort of fashion, and then drop it at the important moment. But we must cease giving examples of this kind, lest we be accused of giving instructions in worldly wisdom, instead of teaching the use of the mind. The impressive pause of the teacher before answering his pupil's question is also an example of the workings of this law. One often says, Stop, let me think a moment. And during his pause, he does not 
really consciously think at all, but stares ahead in a dreamy fashion while his subconscious mind does the work for him, although he little suspects the nature of the operation. One has but to look around him to realize the importance and frequent application of this truth. And not only may the subconscious mind be used in the directions indicated on preceding pages, but in nearly every perplexity and problem of life may it be called upon for help. These little subconscious brownies are ever at our disposal, and seem to be happy to be of service to us. And so far from being apt to get us in a position of false dependence, it is calculated to make us self-confident, for we are calling upon a part of ourselves, not upon some outside intelligence. If those people who never feel satisfied unless they are getting advice from others would only cultivate the acquaintance of this little home advisor within them, they would lose that dependent attitude and frame of mind and would grow self-confident and fearless. Just imagine the confidence of one who feels that he has within him a source of knowledge equal to that of the majority of those with whom he is likely to come in contact, and he feels less afraid to face them and look them fearlessly in the eyes. He feels that his mind is not confined to the little field of consciousness, but is an area infinitely greater containing a mass of information undreamed of. Everything that the man has inherited or brought with him from past lives, everything that he has read, heard, or seen, or experienced in this life, is hidden away there in some quarter of that great subconscious mind, and if he will but give the command, the essence of all that knowledge is his. The details may not be presented to his consciousness, often it is not, for very good occult reasons, but the result or essence of the knowledge will pass before his attention with sufficient examples and illustrations or arguments to enable him to make out a good case for himself. In the next lesson we will call your attention to other features and qualities of this great field of mind, showing you how you can put it to work and master it. Remember, always the I is the master, and its mastery must always be remembered and asserted over all phases and planes of the mind. Do not be a slave to the subconscious, but be its master. Mantram or Affirmation I have within me a great area of mind that is under my command and subject to my mastery. This mind is friendly to me and is glad to do my bidding and obey my orders. It will work for me when I ask it and is constant, untiring, and faithful. Knowing this, I am no longer afraid ignorant or uninformed. The I is master of it all, and is asserting its authority. I am master over body, mind, consciousness, and subconsciousness. I am I, a center of power, strength, and knowledge. I am I, and I am spirit, a fragment from the divine flame. End of the Tenth Lesson Recording by Arabella Grayson.